Includes this test of the emergency broadcast system. Tonight is March 1st, 2009. And what's up, what's up, guys? Welcome to World of the Unexplained. This is Jay Scott, and I am by myself tonight, completely alone. Um, it, it's really a bad, bad thing. It couldn't get much worse. But when I say that, now everything's going to fall down. Chuck is gone. D is gone. Trent is gone. And uh, it's just uh, just one of them things. So we're here. I want to welcome our new affiliate, KFNX, out of Phoenix, Arizona. Um, big station down there. Uh, you guys that are hearing us there the first time tonight, we're going to be on. Um, and we do appreciate you listening. You can give us a call. Our number here, toll free, 1 877 722 7382. That number again, 1 877 Scare You 2. That's toll free anywhere in the U.S. and Canada. And, um, and uh, we're, uh, we're just going to take some calls. Tonight we have an author with us. And that's uh, Leslie Klinger. And. Um, He's going to be on with us here in just a moment. He's written the book. Uh, well, he's not really written the book, but he's annotated the book, Dracula by Bram Stoker. So without further ado, we're going to bring on Leslie Klinger. How are you? Hi, how are you, Leslie? Well, toasty warm in, uh, in very <laughs> sunny Los Angeles today. I hear that. <laughs> Thanks so much for bringing it up. It's nice well, and you know, it's good thirty something. Somebody's warm. <laughs> well, we we haven't got any snow in a long time, so it's it's kind of nice to see it. But it just kind of uh, kind of left me hanging on by myself. I love your book. Thank you, thank you. It was it was great fun to do. Uh, it was I, I I love Dracula and being uh, it, be, justifying spending two years sort of fondling it uh, was wonderful. Awesome. So what, what what made you decide to do this? And I, I'd read before that you would just wanted to stay in the Victorian era. Is that about right? Yes. Well, I, I, I had always loved the book. Um, I read it in college when uh, it scared me beyond belief. I mean, really, it, when I say that, I mean that when I read it, I had no expectation of being scared. It was sort of one of those dusty Victorian classics that I thought I ought to read, and it really scared me. And when I finished uh, my annotated Sherlock Holmes, yes, I wanted to stay in the Victorian era, and Dracula was the logical choice, because I, I like to think that Holmes and Dracula probably walked the streets of London together. <laughs> they were exact contemporaries. Kind of like Ripper, right? <laughs> yes, the Ripper, too. He's certainly part of that mix. Now, t tell some of, the, some of the listeners out there about what, what it is that makes your edition of this book special. Well, I guess I, I like to think of the annotations as kind of the bonus tracks on the DVD, if you will. Um, if you haven't read the book before, uh, I strongly urge readers to ignore the 1,600 footnotes and go straight to the text and enjoy it, but then come back for the notes, because the notes really do a number of things. Um, number one, they provide glossary, just at that most basic level, because we don't speak Victorian English anymore. Sure. Um, Number two, they provide cultural background so that we can understand why the characters are doing the things they're doing. Uh, we, don't, we don't remember the history, the, the politics, the social niceties of the day, and so on. Um, in addition, I decided to play a game with the text. Um, and my excuse is that this is the Sherlockian game. Uh, Sherlock Holmes fans have been doing this for 100 years. And that is to treat the story as a true story. Now, don't you can't see me smiling uh, from that distance, but this is a game, I assure you. But it's a game that's designed to let us really enjoy the text in a different way, because we can really dig in and study things like, can you really take the, the, the train from Varna to Galatz in the time 
that uh, Jonathan or Mina Harker records in the book. Um, are, are the roads in Transylvania really the way they're described, and so on? And and so we we look at the text in a different way when we play this game with it. We look at it at sort of the ground level. Well, I, I noticed one of the uh, one of the footnotes, and I, I'm I'm still early in the book, but um, just just reading all the information, I noticed that one of the uh, one of the footnotes actually calls for a recipe. Uh, for something that um, Jonathan Harker, our lead character, was eating on one of his journeys. Yes. Uh, why not? Uh, <laughs> and uh, I mean, I, I love food. I love wine. I spent some time trying to figure out what some of the wines were that are mentioned in the book. Uh, every, to me, the, the pleasure of these classic books is to read them at the level where you can wander down byways and sort of lose yourself in other interesting things. Uh, I when I think about what I want to footnote, it's got to have a sort of a, gee, that's kind of cool factor to it, as opposed to, oh, I should put in some more dull information. Sure. Uh, there, there's a wonderful example. Um, I was talking about this yesterday with a group, and they all said, yeah, yeah. It was, uh, there's a scene in the book, um, for those who remember it, where Dracula's ship docks in Whitby, and uh, he leaps off the ship in the form of a giant dog, and he runs through the town, and uh, later, in the newspaper account of the shipwreck, uh, they say that one of the dogs in the village has been found with its throat cut, uh, ripped out. Sure. And uh, we understand, of course, that this dog is actually Dracula, and that he's killed this dog who has menaced him while he was in wolf form or dog form. So, in the newspaper account, in the uh, in some of the unpublished material, in, in actually in the manuscript, there's a reference to um, the police considering examining the eyeballs of the dog to try and determine who murdered it. And I looked at that and I said, "Wow, what's that?" Well, there was a crackpot Victorian science called optography that was, the, some scientists tried to prove that you know, dead people's retinas retained the last image that they saw huh. and it was you know it was bunkum but i just thought wow and and jules verne wrote a novel a mystery novel in which that's how the mystery gets solved and i never knew any of that stuff so it's there in a footnote uh, it's, uh, is it directly relevant to dracula no, no but it was it was fun but it's interesting, you know. You think of things like in the, in early criminal investigations, they talk about phrenology, measuring someone's uh, skull size to see if sure. they would be a criminal, or this and that and the other, et cetera. Uh, it, it's just an interesting idea, I, I suppose. Um, to, you know, I don't I don't think that many many readers today, especially um, you know of, of all the people that should be reading things, college students, I just don't think that they read at the level that that they did ten, twenty, thirty years ago. What do you think about that? Well, I think that I think there's some truth to that because it's all now uh, on the internet. But I must say that uh, this book wouldn't have been possible without the internet. So I mean, I don't I don't want to put down computers in the internet because the internet is a tremendous resource tool to try and find um, connections. To try and find, I mean, the idea, for example, just uh, don't get me started on Google Books. I mean, wow, to be able to look up phrases. Or names in tens of thousands of books um, at once uh, is an amazing way to do research for something like this, where I'm looking for those kinds of connections and uh, uh, bits of trivia, uh, background information, and so on. Now, wh- how long did it take you to write this book? Well, this book took about two and a half years, and um, there was a great deal of research involved in doing it. When I when I did the Sherlock Holmes books, um, it it actually took about the same amount of time. But my research for that book consisted, by and large, of turning to my own library, and I have a vast library of books about Sherlock Holmes, as well as a number of Victorian books, and finding everything I needed sort of close at hand. For Dracula, I actually had to sort of hit the hit the road, and I, I went to Transylvania and uh, did research on the geography of the country. Um, I I went to England, and uh, all of these things are reflected in photographs that I stuck in in various places in the book. Uh, England to try and track down some of the places, the the houses that Dracula owned uh, or rented, um, the cemetery in which Lucy was buried. uh, And uh, I had to go to Philadelphia and to Seattle, and those are 
worth mentioning. Philadelphia, because the Rosenbach Museum owns Stoker's Notes. Stoker kept extensive notes during the seven years that he was writing the book. And the notes are fascinating in showing us um, how the book grew, how the character names changed, how the structure changed, uh, and we can learn a great deal about it that way. In Seattle, I was extremely fortunate to be able to see the original manuscript of the book. No scholar has ever written about the manuscript before. Uh, it's owned by billionaire Paul Allen, and uh, I was able to make contact with him, and he let me spend two days looking at the book, and it's fascinating. It's 500 pages of typed material with extensive notes by Stoker, notes by Stoker's editor, notes by Stoker's brother, who was a doctor, um, suppressed material, material that was cut out of the final version of the book, uh, pasted over material, material where literally Stoker cut and pasted a piece of paper over old stuff. You could only see it by holding it up to the light. You could read what was underneath. Oh, wow. I mean, it, was, it was very cool to look at all that. Now, now, Bram Stoker didn't. I mean, he, he really didn't have a lot of uh, a lot of things going for him as far as his career as a writer would be concerned. It seems more like I think, a. I think that's fair to say. He was. He's a fascinating man. He started out as a theater critic in Dublin, and while he was there, he met um, Henry Irving, who was on his way to becoming the the greatest actor, English actor of that generation. Uh, a couple of years later, Irving invited him to come to London to become the essentially the business manager as opposed to the the sort of acting manager the business manager of Irving's repertory company at the Lyceum Theatre in the center of London uh, Irving as I said was uh, by then uh, the greatest actor in England and so Stoker found himself in the middle of a circle of the literati the, the literary celebrities of the day Arthur Conan Doyle uh, James M. Barry. Uh, Rudyard Kipling, etc., and became friends with many of them, um, and and pursued writing. He, he had started to write while he was in Dublin, and he continued writing. He wrote uh, bunches of books. Uh, he wrote a bunch of novels that are, um, I, I guess I'll be polite. I won't call them trash, but um, <laughs> they're not much better than that. They're they're sort of mushy romances. Um, he wrote. Uh, some travelogues about uh, his travels with the repertory company. He wrote a wonderful two-volume reminiscence of Irving, and then Dracula, sort of out of the blue. You know, I, I the, think I think a lot of people, especially especially vampire classics critics, if if you can call them that, for lack of a better term, uh, you know, I've I've heard mention many times that a lot of people feel that he stole a lot of his ideas from the Lord Ruthven character of Polidori. What, what do you what do you think about that? Of course. Oh, I mean, I mean, there's no doubt about it. I would to say he stole. Um, I mean, Lord Ruffin and uh, and Varney the Vampire. Uh, or Lord, Feast of Blood. <laughs> let's, let's do this slowly. The Vampire was a novel written by John Polidori that was published in uh, 1817, I think, and um, it was uh, it was very successful. Um, it, it it starred Lord Ruffin, who is a nobleman. Um, who is a vampire, and he is uh, he does share some of the characteristics of uh, Dracula. Forty years later, uh, Varney the Vampire, you may say, stole from uh, Polidori's The Vampire. Uh, again, a, a noble uh, vampire figure, Varney is a uh, is a nobleman, and uh, he has extensive adventures and is a horrible monster. Um, the the vampire tradition was in existence uh, certainly long before Dracula and and it was so Im much a part of popular culture uh, both of those books became very successful stage plays, numerous stage plays were written from those books that, uh, you know, it's like saying, uh, well, you know he stole the idea, it's like saying Sherlock Conan Doyle stole the idea of the detective from other people, well he did <laughs> you know, detectives were not some new invention. Vampires were not some new invention. In fact, there had been vampire epidemics in Europe uh, for centuries. Um, Stoker knew the folklore, um, did some research into the superstitions of, of Transylvania and other countries, and then put it together in a brilliant way. Sure. And, you know, the, the 
<clears throat> I, I don't know what exactly Stoker read. Like I said, I'm I'm at the beginning of your book still. There's a lot of footnotes here, folks. A you lot. <laughs> and that's why it's annotated. And we know exactly what Stoker read. Actually, there is one mystery, and that is a mystery of whether he knew the book called Carmilla. Uh, this Sheridan is Le Fanu? Kind of a novella written by Sheridan Le Fanu. Um, Sheridan, Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu was a, uh, an, another Irishman. Um, he actually was the publisher of the newspaper that Stoker uh, was a drama critic for. But it's, we don't have any evidence that they ever met. Um, it, it's really the first female vampire tale, and uh, it was published in France, and a very influential tale. Um, we don't know that Stoker read it, though, or, oh. or knew. He probably read it. Did he know Le Fanu? Maybe. Well, what, what, about, what about maybe Montague Summers and some of that work? Well, that's later. Summers, okay. is, Summers is in the early 20th century. So he didn't have any any of that sort of folkloric um, histories to work with. He did have a book called Transylvanian Superstitions by uh, Elizabeth Girard, and he clearly picked up a word out of there. He picked up the word Nosferatu ah. from that, um, which uh, she got wrong. She she understood that that word meant vampire. It doesn't mean that at all, but uh, that's what she got. To. Well, what does it mean? I'm curious. I don't, I don't even remember, but it, it doesn't mean that. Um, and uh, he he definitely knew that book uh, that that uh, it, it was an article in a, in a magazine called uh, the 19th Century, and uh, he he knew it, and we know that he knew it because he actually kept lists of the books that he studied and uh, that he research, did his research in. We also know exactly from his notes where the name Dracula came from, and uh, this is interesting I think because it really puts the kibosh on the on the notion that he somehow based the character on Vlad the Impaler. Here's what we know. Um, when he was reading a history of the province of Wallachia, Wallachia is next door to Transylvania, he came across a footnote about an historical figure named Vlad Dracul. Uh, Dracul and in the footnote it explains that Vlad was a, uh, a prince of Wallachia, and Dracul means dragon or demon, and his son was Vlad Dracula, meaning son of the dragon, uh, and he was, of course, Vlad the Impaler. Um, that's all that we know that Stoker knew about Vlad the Impaler, was that he saw the name. And actually in the notes, you can see that in the early years, in the earliest years, the, the central character of the book was going to be named Count Wampir. Not quite the same zing. It just doesn't hit, yeah. <laughs> but uh, he went back and he changed it throughout his notes to Dracula. He liked the name. And uh, that's what he took from Vlad the Impaler. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, where, where can people go and get your book, Les? Well, I'd like to say bookstores everywhere. Um, it's certainly available on the Internet um, uh, through Barnes & Noble and uh, Amazon. Um, it is, uh, you know, it's widely available in the Barnes & Noble and Border bookstores um, across the country. I know many, many independents have it. To my pleasure, a lot of the mystery independent bookstores are carrying it as well, um, and that makes me proud because I support those bookstores. Cool. Well, Les, well, we're going to take a short break. I want you to hang out with us here. Folks, when we, come, when, we, when we come back, you can Working give us a call. my tan. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I hear that. Uh, when we come back, you can give us a call here at 877-722-7382. That's toll-free in the United States and Canada. Or you can call us locally, 336-996-1596. Or you can call the 800 number again. Easier to remember if you spell it out, 877-SCARE, the letter U, the number 2, 877-SCARE-U-2. So uh, just give us a call here. You're listening to World of the Unexplained, and we're going to come right back at you in just a minute after this. And we're back, World of the Unexplained. You can check us out on the web at www.worldoftheunexplained.com. Um, you can check out um, Mr. Klinger's website at um, www.annotateddracula.com. And uh, if you go to our webpage, we've got a link there where you can look at the book, look at his bio, and, um, and kind of see what's going on. Uh, let's, um, we'll take some callers real quick if, if we've got any out there that want to call in, 877-722-7382. That t call is toll-free. And uh, we'll get back into some of the stuff that's going on in the book. Let's talk about some of the illustrations. Well, I had wonderful fun with the illustrations. The, the, uh, 
Sherlock Holmes books really sort of set me off down this path. That there are over a thousand illustrations in my annotated Sherlock Holmes, and probably um, two thirds of those are public domain illustrations of the stories themselves, drawn by uh, various artists that appeared in the Strand magazine and many other American magazines and newspapers over the years. Dracula, there was a problem. The problem is that um, it didn't really come out in an illustrated edition until the 1950s. So I had to, I wanted to find cool stuff to put in there. And what I did was I ended up using a lot of illustrations from Varney the Vampire, uh, which was heavily illustrated, very interesting woodcuts for that. Plus, I used lots of dust jackets from editions of Dracula and uh, dozens and dozens of movie stills and, and some scenes from stage plays as well uh, to try and give the reader some sense of what these things look like. I also have an extensive collection of Victorian pictures, um, pictures of objects, people, places, etc. that are mentioned in the book that I included as well. And then finally, there's pictures I took myself. Oh, well, I noticed some of the pictures that, that you took. They're, they're really good. Um, the you, you know, I think a lot of people, when they think about Dracula, they all go back to either Bela Lugosi, first and foremost, for his portrayal in the first movie, but they also go back to a lot of the Hammer film stuff. And I think that's just kind of stuck out in, in the minds of at least Americans and possibly worldwide as to what Dracula is. What Absolutely. Do you think about that? Uh, although it's interesting because they are, those are what I would call distorted images of Dracula. Um, in the original book, we see that Dracula is a tall, thin, old man with a long white mustache, with uh, long, sharp fingernails, teeth that protrude over his lips, hair on his palms, and bad breath. Bad <laughs> breath because he's a corpse. Sure. So this isn't exactly the romantic figure that uh, Bela Lugosi cuts, or Frank Langella cuts, uh, or that even uh, Christopher Lee portrays. For Lee is scary, but he's also, you know, <laughs> good-looking. Uh, this is a monster. And when we think about the films, there's really only one film that did the monster, and that's Nosferatu, the, the very first Dracula film. 1922. Uh, 1922. And after that, it all went downhill. It became distorted. Um, it, 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 the first distortion was actually the stage play. The stage play was was uh, 1927, and it was it starred uh, a man named Raymond Huntley in England, a uh, good-looking guy uh, in that sort of classic look of the opera cape and the tuxedo, the white tie and tails, and the hair slicked back. And then in America, it starred a young Austro-Hungarian actor named Bela Lugosi uh, on the stage. And he was, uh, the critics didn't like him, but the audiences loved him. Uh, flowers, every performance, and the women swooning and all that. <laughs> and when the film came to be cast, Carl Lemley Jr. did a national talent search. He really, he, his first choice was Lon Chaney, but Chaney was too ill to play the part and died shortly after that. Uh, and uh, reluctantly, he cast Lugosi in the part, um, who, of course, became the iconic look. Sure. Now, now <clears throat> you mentioned Nosferatu. I was uh, lucky enough to actually, back in 1997, I was in college, and I was uh, I was at a, uh, a friend of mine's uh, place. He, he was basically living in Germany. He went to Davidson College, and he was taking the German major. And uh, he said, hey, guys, spring break. You guys come out here, fly over to Germany. We'll have a great time. I'm in Wurzburg, and we'll, we'll just tunnel around western Bavaria, drink all we can drink, and uh, eat all we can eat, and all that kind of good stuff. So what is a young 20-year-old person to do at that point in time, me being 20 and turning 21 in Germany, but to take him up on that offer and go? Well, one night, knowing how much it, I, I like the Nosferatu and the, the whole Dracula idea, they were, well, there was actually a playhouse there, and the night that he took us there, it was a surprise. They had the original Nosferatu played on the, on the projector, and they had a live person there playing the piano. And, of course, you, you couldn't understand anything because all the subtitles were in German. But what a cool atmosphere it was, I have to say. Oh, it's a very <laughs> scary film. And, and interestingly, I mean, Nosferatu is very important to the vampire folklore because it invented this idea that sunlight destroys the vampire. Uh, picked up later in such 
films, certainly in the Christopher Lee series, the Hammer series, um, and later. It's not in the book. That yeah. is not part of the book Dracula. The, in fact, there are a number of scenes where Dracula is up and about in the daytime outside. I think I think that would be uh, a lot of people probably wouldn't know that because a lot of people probably just equate the films with uh, with the book. Sure. Uh, I, I think the the best as far as you were, you were talking earlier about uh, about the, the the hair on the palms and the you, you know all the the disgusting kind of. Uh, characteristics that, that Dracula shared. I think it was best done um, in the latest film. Well, I guess it's not really the latest, but it came out, I guess, around 1994, um, 93 maybe, the uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula by Coppola. Well, you know, I, I agree with you. I think the first part of the film is is very good. It it actually is very close to the, to the novel um, in, in the look of Gary Oldman in the castle. But then when they get to England, it sort of loses it and turns into this mushy romance and this whole <laughs> notion that Coppola came up with that Mina was the reincarnation of Dracula's lost uh, mortal wife. Uh, you know, it's just he invented all that stuff, and then he had the nerve to call it Bram Stoker's Dracula. Sure. <laughs> well, what's what's next on the horizon for you as far as annotations go? Well, I'm I'm about to undertake something um, unique. Uh, my friend Neil Gaiman and I have been talking for years about doing the annotated Sandman, uh, the magnificent comic book series that uh, Neil wrote, uh, huh. 75 issues. And uh, DC has just said uh, yes, and uh, it, I'm going to start working on it. It's a huge project. Uh, this will be four volumes. This is, as you may know, the Sandman has 75 issues. Um, nobody has ever done an annotated comic book before, so I'm very uh, excited to do it. There is such a depth of material in these comics, and that's why they need annotation. That That's amazing. Um, <clears throat> how, how long do you think this is going to take? Oh, it'll probably take me two or three years. I would think. I mean, you know, I, I uh, like you, Jay. I practice law, and uh, <laughs> my my clients when the uh, when when the Sherlock Holmes books came out, uh, my clients, several clients, said to me, uh, "Oh, we're so sad. You're giving up the practice of law." And I said, "Giving up the practice? Do you have any idea what authors make?" <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I practice law full time. So uh, doing this annotation stuff is, I, is my passion, but it's confined to evenings and weekends and holidays. Sure. So I, I, just, I still don't see how you find the time to do it all, though. Well, my kids are grown. My wife is very supportive, and I'm obsessive. Now it says here in your bio that you're a member of the Horror Writers of America. Are they the ones that give out the Bram Stoker Award? They are. Have you written any fiction? I have not done any fiction. Um, the I have one Sherlock Holmes story that I wrote years ago, and uh, although I have lots of ideas, ideas are a dime a dozen, as any fiction writer will tell you. It's the execution. I don't know that I have the talent. I, I, I like to think I do a good job of writing footnotes, and it's a little tiny talent, and I continue to nurture that. Um, I've written, you know, essays and things like that, but I've never tried fiction. Fortunately, there is a category for the uh, Stoker Awards, for nonfiction. Okay, that was my next uh, and, question. <laughs> uh, my book is on the preliminary ballot, but uh, that's not, that's not, we won't even call that a nomination because it's not yet a nomination, so. Okay. Well, well, we'll definitely, we'll definitely look forward to doing, you know, to hearing from you if, if something happens with that. Well, I, I, my fingers are crossed, but, you know, it's a, it's a, a vote by all the members of the Horror Writers Association, and uh, I would be greatly honored to win, but I, I did win the Edgar for the uh, Sherlock Holmes books, and I thought I was going to faint. I mean, it was <laughs> the highlight of my little life so far. Sure. Now, now you went you went over to Transylvania. You said earlier to do yeah. a lot of this research. How was that? It was really a wonderful experience. I went over there to give a talk at a symposium on Dracula. Um, the uh, Transylvanian Society of Dracula sponsored an international symposium, and uh, there were uh, people there from England, Canada, the States, uh, Germany, and, uh, uh, of course, Romania and Hungary and some countries like that. Um, and then we took a tour of the country for about a week, and it's a lovely, lovely country. It's very rural. 
Uh, there are really only three major cities. Uh, Bucharest is two million people. There are, two, I guess, there's four major cities. There are three cities of 500,000 population, and then the rest are villages. They're all very small villages. And when you drive around, you don't see tractors. You see horse-drawn plows. Mom and dad out in the field with the horse uh, pulling the plow, and or an oxen pulling the plow. And it, so it's very rural. It's very pretty. Very friendly. Um, they're, they have adopted vampires as their sort of tourist industry, which is interesting because Transylvania never had any legends of vampires. Um, and they've made a big deal out of Vlad the Impaler. Vlad, Vlad is a big national hero to the Transylvanians. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry, to the Wallachians and uh, uh, actually generally to Romania. Uh, because he stood up against the Turks when they were invaded by the Turks. Um, and so there are a number of tourist sites that you can go see about uh, Vlad, but uh, all of them basically play this vampire card. So you'll see tourist junk um, connecting Vlad to vampirism, to vampirism and to, and to Dracula everywhere. And the tour guides are wonderful. We're at uh, Castle Bran, which is a beautiful castle built, uh, really upgraded and built substantially in the, in the 19th century. Uh, and the tour guides are talking about, well, Bram Stoker stood here and looked out there and look at that view. And Stoker never went to Transylvania. <laughs> but the tour guides want to tell you that he did and that the book was inspired there. I, I had a very difficult time finding a copy of Dracula in Transylvania. I finally found a bookstore that had a copy. You're in kidding. Romanian. <laughs> You're kidding me. <laughs> Oh, what about Dracula's castle? That's a big seller, isn't it? Well, Castle Bran is known as Dracula's castle, but of course, <laughs> as I said, it really has nothing to do with Dracula. <laughs> wow. Now, can, can you stay there overnight? No. Okay, it's just a just a walk through kind yeah, of tour. It's a beautiful castle because sure. it was owned. It was it was the king and queen of Romania um, lived there uh, at the end of the 19th century. So it's a lovely castle. Very fairy tale like castle, but has nothing to do with Dracula. <laughs> wow, what a uh, that's uh, an, an enlightening story. <laughs> there, there are some evocative parts. I mean, I, I must say, going through uh, some of the mountainous passes and and uh, passing through some of the places mentioned in the book is is interesting. They they don't match the descriptions in the book um, because Stoker by and large just kind of made it up. Um, <laughs> But there are places that could have been the places that Stoker uh, uh, meant to describe. And there is a there is a hotel, there is a place called Castle Dracula Hotel, uh, which is in the Borgo Pass. Uh, it was built by a promoter in the 70s, oh. uh, and uh, it plays up the vampire Dracula theme. It's got a statue of Bram Stoker in the courtyard and so on. Uh, but, you know, it has no authentic connections to the, uh, so to the Did you stay there? Story. Did you stay there? Yes, <laughs> okay. there one night, and ate at the hotel in a neighboring town called the Golden Crone, which again is a name taken from Dracula. They named it after the uh, hotel mentioned in the book, as opposed to vice versa. Huh. It, it's not a. It wasn't really the place where Jonathan Harker stayed. No, no, no. I thought that Stoker. It seemed like from your annotations, what what I've read of it. Um, that Stoker had used some kind of travel guide, a Transylvanian travel guide for some of his Yes, there were, there were a number of Victorian um, books. I mean, Transylvania was... The, the reason Stoker picked Transylvania as the site was that it was kind of like today, putting it on the dark side of the moon. I mean, it was a place that very, very few English people had traveled to. It was known as a place of sort of a whirlpool. The Carpathian Mountains were described in some travel books as kind of a whirlpool of superstition. Um, it, it was far, far away, and there were only spotty reports about the customs there. Um, so Stoker read a lot of the travel books that had been written by other Englishmen who had been there in the early 19th century and mid-19th century, and he copied descriptions out of those books. Now, now what is, I'm going to sound really dumb here, um, but that's okay. I do that all the time. What is this, uh, this, this Aust uh, let's see here, the Austrian uh, Baedecker? I'm sure I'm, I'm slaughtering oh, that. A Baedecker is a guidebook. Uh, Baedecker... 
I'm trying to think sort of the English equivalent. I guess it's like the triple A books. Um, Baedecker was a very successful, Carl Baedecker, a very successful promoter who, when the great craze for travel struck in the middle of the 19th century, decided that just as Thomas Cook packaged tours, he would do guidebooks. So he did extensive, extensive, I mean, these are Bibles, guidebooks, for virtually every country in Europe and, of course, uh, Great Britain uh, and London, too. And uh, they came out pretty much every 10 years, something like that. And they, they not only describe in minute detail um, the hotels, the museums, uh, the, the tourist sites, they recommended hotels, they recommended restaurants, and so on. Um, today, there's things like the Blue Guide or the Michelin Guide the, 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 that, that have the same kind of things. But Baedecker was the 19th century travel book. Hmm. Well, Leslie, I, I, I hate that our time is, is almost over. I'm going to give well, you the last talk one. for another three hours here. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd definitely love to have you back. Well, it'd be my pleasure. Well, we can talk about Sherlock Holmes. We can talk about Dracula. We can talk about whatever you like. Sure. Well, I'll give you the last word. Well, um, if you haven't read Dracula and you only know the movies, by all means, read the book. And, of course, if you're going to buy the book, you might as well buy mine. <laughs> Very well said. Thank you. That was uh, Leslie Klinger. Thank you so much for coming on the show tonight. My pleasure. So. All right. And uh, that was Leslie Klinger. You can check out his book at uh, Amazon.com, or you can go to his site, AnnotatedDracula.com, and uh, you can take care of it that way. But uh, listen, guys, give us a call, anybody out there listening in Phoenix or in anywhere in, in the free world here, 877-722-7382. Uh, that's 877-SCARE-U2. And um, I will, uh, we'll just keep rolling along with it then, I guess. <laughs> so um, it's... Um, it's uh, the far left, the far left. There we go. All right. It, it, I apologize to everybody because usually I have a whole crew of people working around me, and it makes things sound smooth, and it makes things uh, work a lot better. And I'm kind of I'm kind of stuck here right now. So um, I'll just continue talking. Listen to the sound of my voice, and uh, we'll uh, go from there. I've got I'm uh, <laughs> to the end of my rope here. Uh, but give me a call, guys, uh, 877-722-7382. Tell me what's on your mind, 877-722-7382. That's 877-SCARE-U-2. Uh, that's a letter U, the number 2, kind of like the band, you know, U-2, SCARE-U-2. Um, but anyway, this show is uh, basically a show for those of you listening to the first time. Uh, we talk about all kinds of things on this show. We talk about UFOs. We talk about aliens. We talk about ghosts. We talk about uh, demon possession, exorcism, um, and every now and then we just just bring on guests like like we had tonight, Les Klinger, who who wrote this annotated Dracula book because Dracula is a subject that we just find fascinating. Uh, the good old uh, scare the bejeebies out of you at the campfire site that we all grew up with as kids. Um, <clears throat> But we've had numerous guests on that you can check out on our website, www.worldoftheunexplained.com. If you go to that website, you can listen to some of the older interviews. Um, we, we've talked to um, the high, the, we've talked about the uh, Highgate Vampire with uh, Bishop Sean Manchester, who claimed to actually have uh, staked an actual vampire in the 70s. We've talked with um, exorcists. We've talked with all kinds of people. So when you get a chance, just check that out, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll definitely talk with you. Um, you know, about the new shows coming up. And we've got Ron on from Raleigh here in just a second. Um, so we're going to, we'll be bringing in Ron here from Raleigh, North Carolina. I bet the snow's coming down there. It's starting to, Jay. How are you doing, man? <laughs> I'm doing good, man. Thanks for calling in. I'm starting. I, I just feel so, I don't know. I'm so used to having other people besides me, and it kind of got me a little nervous there. I know. Well, that was a great interview. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, have, have you Have you read Dracula? Um, you know, I've read parts of it before, but I've never had to sit down and write a paper on it, I guess, which is what motivates most people to write books, I mean, to uh, to read books back in the day. Sure. How many times have you read it, Jack? Oh, man, probably twice, <laughs> but uh, over the course of, you know, uh, and it, you know, I, I, I think when I was a kid, I read the abridged version, and then when I got into high school, I read the full thing, and I haven't picked it up since until just recently here. Wow. What's what's a what's a weather like out there, man? The snow's been coming down here. We've got about an inch probably so far. I know it's in, um, in North Carolina. I'm in North Carolina, and um, I want to say hello to all the listeners in on uh, 
uh, KFNX in uh, Phoenix. Awesome. But, um, yeah, we're looking. it looks like a winter storm's coming through, probably about two inches here, and I guess you guys are going to get about four. No, I hope so. I hope so. It, it's, uh, I think it, looking at Phoenix weather right now, I think it's probably 84 degrees is what I'm looking at up here on the internet. <laughs> so uh, they're not hurting from the snow, but uh, we definitely are, and we haven't had any in a while. I know. I was looking on the uh, internet earlier tonight about Phoenix. I saw uh, there, where there were some Phoenix lights. They had gotten some YouTube stuff from February. Oh, really? Where there were some UFOs over Phoenix. So. A lot of UFOs in the Phoenix area. Well, just in Arizona in particular, I suppose. I know. So and we'll be and we'll be talking about some of that later. On. Next week we're going to have on uh, John Zappas is going to come on and talk about some of the exorcism stuff that he's he's been a part of in the past and what he's working on now. I think that could be definitely a, something new. And then we'll, we'll we may or may not have tomorrow night's regularly scheduled show eight to ten. Um, listen on our site if your affiliate doesn't pick us up. WorldoftheUnexplained.com. But um, I think we'll go ahead and continue with that. Yeah, definitely, man. I mean, you guys have got a lot of guests that you've already um, have interviewed over the years, and I know I've heard a lot of great interviews. And there's, um, it's not just about um, paranormal experiences. I know there's a lot of people that are interested about that in North Carolina and also probably in the Phoenix area. But there's been a lot of um, a Christian discussion about um, religion and the place of God in you know paranormal activities. I guess. Sure. Sure. <clears throat> Well, Ron, I appreciate you calling, man, but we're we're, gonna, we're on our way out, so uh, uh, take care, and uh, we'll talk again soon. All right, Jay. You guys stay safe in the snow. All right. Everybody uh, in Phoenix is okay, too. You do the same, buddy. All right. Good night. Good night. And that was Ron from Raleigh. Once again, our number toll-free, 877-722-7382. Um, once again, John Zaffis is going to be our guest next week, and John's done a lot of stuff. You've probably seen him. If you watch TV at all, he's been on the Haunting uh, series on A&E. I, I believe it's A&E that shows that. He's also the um, nephew of Ed and Lorraine Warren, um, who were the uh, people that did the whole Amityville horror investigation so many years ago. And, uh, you know, he, he's we've done some investigations with him. He's good friends with uh, Jason and Grant from the TAPS team. Um, you know, they, they've done some investigations together. And he's also sat in a lot of exorcisms. Actually, there's a movie coming out... Uh, the Haunting in Connecticut or something something along the lines of that name. And uh, one of the characters in the film is based on John Zappos. So we're going to talk about that um, next week as well. Um, he's going to tell us about the only house was that one where he actually had to leave for a couple of days and, um, and you know, just basically couldn't take it, decides whether or not he really wants to do that kind of work anymore. And it just really freaked him out. And uh, he did come back to it, but... Uh, just one of those things that really scared him, and he didn't know um, he didn't know what was going on or what to do. But um, I'm going to try to reach some things over here and get some music cranked up again. Um, play, and uh, try, this is awful. <laughs> so uh, anyway, but uh, we're coming to the bottom of our time tonight, and uh, it's three. And I'm trying to have a conversation. And uh, we're coming to the bottom of our time tonight. So uh, I really hope that you enjoyed uh, what you heard. Uh, my name is Jay Scott. You're listening to World of the Unexplained. Um, and you can check us out once again, www.worldoftheunexplained.com. And once again, www.worldoftheunexplained.com. And uh, I will you know, look forward to hearing from you next week. We will see you soon. That's it for tonight.